Um, I work at the Illinois Natural History Survey Medical Entomology Lab. Um, I'm a vector ecologist. It's kind of an arcane profession. It sounds like wizard. Um, and basically what I uh, specialize in are spineless bloodsuckers. That's kind of how I like to put it. Um, if there's an invertebrate that's biting you and taking blood and potentially transmitting a disease agent, uh, that's what I can answer questions about. Um, if anything comes up during the presentation uh, today, please uh, feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, I'm not in my office a lot right now, so I might not pick up a phone call. But today I'll spend about 20 minutes talking about our current tick surveillance efforts in the state. There's a lot of new stuff going on, uh, ticks and tick-borne diseases in Illinois, and what you can do to prevent tick bites. Um, <clears throat> hold on just a second, I'm gonna minimize this screen, okay. Um, although, you know, I'm a mosquito effort, I won't have time today to discuss me, uh, mosquitoes, but our lab would love to give a separate talk on those. We've got a lot that's uh, new on that uh, field too. Um, and if you do have questions about mosquitoes at the end today, I'm happy to answer them. They're also an area of expertise for me. So today I'm going to address two broad topics. Uh, first, I'm, I'll introduce our current active tick surveillance program in Illinois and highlight some tick species and disease agents to watch out for. And then I'll present information on tick bite avoidance. Some slides will have links to resources, and as Jennifer noted, this presentation will be uploaded online, so you can refer back to the information and links. So first, a brief primer on our state surveillance program and some information about ticks and diseases in Illinois. The INHS Medical Entomology Lab began this tick surveillance program in mid-2019 through a partnership with IDPH. We're following CDC guidelines on how to go out into the environment, collect ticks where they occur, and identify them and test them at our lab for tick-borne disease agents. Uh, so that's all happening in your county. Uh, Lab personnel are connect, collecting ticks throughout the state and stakeholders are also collecting ticks at forest preserve districts or public health districts and then sending them to us for identifications and testing. We're also conducting special collections of ticks when people in the state fall ill with a tick-borne disease and you'll see a little bit more about that in a few slides. Our goal over time is to conduct several visits to multiple sites in every county in the state. So we have an outstanding new resource that's at the IDPH website that I want you to be aware of. Uh, we now have maps up of uh, ticks that we're finding uh, and the disease agents we're finding in them, but it's a little bit tricky to navigate. So I'm actually gonna use an animation here to uh, show you how to use this resource. So, like I said, this is at the IDPH website. Very long, complicated uh, route to get there, but I'll show you how to navigate to it soon. And it's with tick data that we're providing to IDPH that's updated regularly. There's actually been an update since I made this animation uh, back in May. You can learn about the different species of ticks of human health concern in Illinois by clicking on these tabs. And then when you're within a single tick tab, you can learn about disease agents that we're picking up when we actually test the ticks. So it covers every county in Illinois. Uh, we haven't gotten to all of them yet, but if we know whether a tick's established or reported, or we haven't picked them up or haven't looked yet, it's on the map. You can also learn more about that tick species uh, biology, including pathogens it transmits, when it's active during the year, and uh, links to CDC information on it. Additionally, you can learn about pathogens like Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the causative agent of Lyme disease. You can get more information about the biology of that pathogen. And some of this information uh, is very useful for doctors and it's all provided by IDPH, including information about treatment. There are links to more information on the given pathogen and links to our lab where all of the ticks are being tested. If you click on individual counties in the map, this kind of a hidden feature, 
you can see how many ticks we've tested for that disease agent in the county and how many uh, have been found to be positive. So you get an idea of uh, the prevalence. And this is a really cool feature of the map. Um, the folks at IDPH put this together and um, you'll have to zoom into the map to see uh, what I'm talking about in a second, but you can get an idea of where different uh, risk areas for tick uh, bite occurrence are. So you zoom in and then you can actually see different land cover types on the map, such as forested areas where you're gonna have the highest risk for most tick-borne disease agents. Uh, and you can see in your county where those areas are. So getting to the map, it's not straightforward. <laughs> um, so if you go to the IDPH website, dph.illinois.gov, then click on topics and services, and scroll down to environmental health protection, and then scroll all the way down to vector control and surveillance and click on that. I'm gonna pop up in a second here. Go all the way over to the right and click on the Illinois Tick Surveillance Map. It takes a minute to load. Every time you open the map, it'll take a minute to load. There are a lot of data uh, embedded in this map and then you're ready to go to learn about the uh, different counties you're interested in. So we have some new tick species um, that, that people, or tick-borne disease agents that people aren't uh, as aware of. Um, we've really been kind of moving the map on this, um, and so I wanna share that with you. But first, um, why you know, do are ticks of such health concern? Um, the ticks of greatest human health concern in Illinois belong to a group known as three host hard ticks. These ticks tend to be very effective vectors because they go through four life stages, egg, larva, nymph, adult, and require a blood meal from a new host to advance to each new stage. So larvae require a blood meal before molting to nymphs, nymphs require one before molting to adults, and adult females require a massive blood meal to gestate eggs. Most adult males will also take uh, smaller blood meals. So this accumulation of hosts over a tick's lifetime also means they can accumulate disease agents as they grow. And humans are typically bit by nymphs and adults, meaning those ticks already took one to two blood meals before biting us. So I'm gonna present some specific species here. And for all of these slides on ticks, you'll see the tick appearance in the upper left, a chart of when the life stages that typically bite humans are active during the year on the lower left, and a map of tick distributions. So this one, Amblyoma americanum, the lone star tick, it appears to be most abundant in Southern Illinois, but it will likely spread north across the state and eventually be abundant throughout. We're doing a lot of central Illinois collections right now, and we are picking up uh, heavy populations of Lone Star ticks as far north as Clinton Lake. Um, they're also known as the turkey tick or turkey mite. Then their larvae can be confused as chiggers. Uh, they're aggressive biters and all life stages will bite humans. They are associated with disease agents of human ehrlichiosis and tularemia and two new emerging diseases I'll talk a bit more about now. So you've got two diseases presented here, number one, number two. Uh, on the left there, Heartland virus is an emerging disease in Illinois and in the US in general. It was only recently discovered in two patients in Missouri. Extensive field surveys implicated the Lone Star tick as the vector, and Illinois had two human cases in 2018. In 2019, we conducted tick collections at the suspected sites of human tick bites. Uh, and that was in Kankakee and Williamson counties. And we found positive ticks at both of those sites. So a publication on the investigation is coming out in July. Um, and you can also email me for a copy of it if you want. Um, Alpha-gal allergy. Now we're moving on to number two on the right. This is another disease associated with Lone Star ticks, and it's really weird. It presents as an allergy to mammal meat and mammal byproducts. Symptoms can be as severe as anaphylaxis, or they can present as kind of vague, ongoing gastrointestinal distress. 
There is a definitive test for this allergy. And if you're interested, reach out to an allergist for more information. They tend to be the best informed. Data on that map there that was recently shared at CDC Vector Week based on human test results indicates this disease does occur in Illinois. And I've heard anecdotally from people in the state that they were bit in the state and uh, saw an allergist for a definitive test. So we'll move on to the next tick, Amblyoma maculatum, the Gulf Coast tick. So this tick was recently shown to be established in Illinois, uh, and I'll have a link to the publication on the next slide. Little is currently known about its distribution, but we are uh, all over the state right now looking in very specific places for it. We do think it might be very focally distributed uh, with some strong environmental associations. Adults are the life stage that tend to bite humans, and they're fairly aggressive biters when encountered. Unlike other tick species in the state, which are usually associated with forests, this species can be found in sunny, dry areas such as prairies and roadsides. Its overall appearance is quite similar to the more common American dog tick, uh, and it might be overlooked even by someone familiar with tick identification. So if you think you've encountered the Gulf Coast tick, please send me samples or contact me for more information. So, Rickettsia parkeri is an emerging disease agent in the U.S. that's transmitted by the Gulf Coast tick. We recently tested Gulf Coast ticks from southern Illinois and found a very high incidence of this pathogen. The publication is available in the Journal of Parasitology or by contacting me. It causes symptoms very similar to Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever but it also typically presents with a scab at the site of the bite called an inoculation S-char. And you can see pictures of those in the lower right. Very importantly, no specific test for this disease agent exists, but it can cause positive tests, uh, positive results on a test for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. So some of our human cases of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever in Illinois might actually be the disease caused by this disease agent. And if you look in the lower left there, uh, the University of Illinois also had a blog post on this that's a nice summary that you can navigate to. The next species, Dermacensor variabilis, the American dog tick, uh, is abundant and common throughout the state. And I'm sure that most of y'all in the audience have encountered it. The adults tend to be the life stage that bites humans. And it is the vector of the bacterium that causes Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. This is a super serious illness. It's killed people. It's, it's killed people in Champaign County. Um, it has a wide range of habitats and it readily bites people. And the fourth of five tick species I want you to be clued into is Ixodes scapularis, the black-legged tick. It is the vector of several human disease agents that cause debilitating illnesses, including Lyme disease. And it can transmit more than one disease agent in a single bite. During the course of our surveillance so far, we have significantly expanded knowledge of where this species and the disease agents it transmits occur in Illinois. For this species and others, I encourage you to check out that interactive map that I showed you at the IDPH website. Adults can be active over the entire winter. They're very cold hardy. Uh, on any day with little to no snow or rain, when temperatures are above around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And keep in mind, uh, this can be when temperatures become elevated in very, very focal microclimates. I've collected adults several days after heavy snow in Joe Davies County on southern facing slopes with strong sun. The nymphs are considered the life stage of highest disease transmission risk because they are easier to overlook during a tick check. And we have a possible new emerging tick pathogen associated with this species. So Borrelia miyamotoa, is in the same group as the bacterium that causes Lyme. It is transmitted to humans by black-legged ticks, which are also the vector of the disease agent of Lyme. And we have found this disease agent 
intakes in Illinois. It does not cause Lyme, but the symptoms such as fever, chills, and joint and muscle aches are very, very similar. However, it's not associated with a rash like Lyme and will not typically cause a positive result on a Lyme test. So this presents us with a challenging diagnostic scenario. A person might have a documented black-legged tick bite, have many symptoms of Lyme, but no rash, and have a negative Lyme test, but still have an active tick-borne infection. A human test does exist for this disease agent, but it has to be ordered by a doctor. And then finally, uh, although we've not found this species in Illinois, uh, it's likely only a matter of time before we do. Uh, Haemophysalis longicornis, the Asian longhorn tick, uh, was recently introduced to the US and has so far been, far been found on a wide array of hosts, including humans. It has not been associated with human, any human diseases in the US, uh, but it is in its native uh, range. And once it reaches an area, it has great potential to spread uh, very rapidly because females can reproduce without needing a mate. This tick could be confused with other species. So if you think you have encountered one, please consult me. Um, their larvae tend to occur in very high numbers in small spaces. If you are just absolutely crawling with larvae, it could be this. And so finally, to wrap up this section, I do want to point out we have instructions at our lab website for sending in loose ticks. And if you found a loose tick and would like an ID of that, uh, feel free to send it to me. We aren't testing ticks uh, that individuals are sending. We only test ticks that we collect out in the field. Um, and, I, and there are different things that you can do for attached ticks. So this would just be ticks that you find crawling on your pants or crawling on your dog. And you can get that information at our website. So the next section is about uh, tick bite prevention. I think the primary form of tick bite prevention and tick-borne disease reduction is actually rooted in human behavior. If we can avoid ticks, remove them before they can bite, or remove them properly and quickly after attachment, we can reduce tick-borne diseases. So where are ticks found? Uh, what does the ideal tick habitat include? It's going to be conducive to humid microclimates and tick host presence. Ticks face two major constraints to having a successful life, drying out and finding blood hosts. So if you're looking for areas, so you're looking for areas with leaf litter, ground cover and shrubs or understory, canopy cover and wood debris or rock piles where small rodents proliferate and slows where mammals like to shelter. This is your ideal habitat bingo. It doesn't take all of these elements, but you are looking for any of them. The one exception to this is the Gulf Coast tick that I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's considered mesophilic, dry loving, and can be found in, in vastly different habitats, uh, warm, dry prairie grasses and roadsides. So ticks have uh, two way, main ways of, of finding a host. Uh, for the ticks of human health concern, the two main strategies are sit and wait, and you can see this dermacenter tick here on the right, crawling up a blade of grass and waving its four legs around, trying to pick up some CO2 and radiant heat. And then all species use this, sit and wait. But then we also have some that are more specialized in ambush. And you'll see a video on the right here of a lone star tick the center there, she's about, she's emerging right now. She's got a big white spot on her back. This is about how big she'll look in real life and crawling all over the leaf litter. Um, these ticks, Lone Star ticks, when they ambush, um, I've seen them run across the forest floor for me uh, over several meters. Uh, they're very, very hardy ambush predators. You'll find ticks questing, like I've uh, mentioned, on the tips of grass, sometimes in very large clumps, like you see on the left, in humid grassy microclimates. And they're typically at a higher abundance in the forest and forest edge than on gravel, sand, wood chips, or mowed grass. So there are landscaping remedies that we can use to reduce tick abundance near trails. 
And I gave a webinar recently for Illinois Extension on that, um, that I can share with you if you contact me. Our own Department of Public Health has an outstanding vector control team that's producing new educational materials for free public use. And here are some links to a few of those. Okay, so when visiting environments that may harbor ticks, a few tricks can greatly reduce tick bites. Because ticks quest on grass stalks or in the leaf litter, they are typically, typically going to transfer onto our bodies at thigh level or below. They will then stereotypically crawl up until they find a place to bite. For that reason, when you're outdoors, regularly scan your body looking for ticks. I start at my torso, then scan down my legs, front and back, then scan back up. And I do this every few minutes when I'm outside. Uh, wear light colored clothing to make seeing the ticks easier and make an ascending barrier out of your clothes. Tuck your pants into socks, shirt into pants, and wear a hat and tuck in your hair. Walk in the center of trails, although I know that's probably not uh, possible for, for y'all here. And I have a more stringent PPE I'd be happy to share with you. Um, my team also puts double-sided carpet tape around the tops of our boots to stop any ticks from crawling past that point. And chemical protection can also be very powerful. Uh, you need to remember to read labels carefully and use EPA registered repellents. They've been shown to work. The EPA has a really great repellent choosing tool where you can enter in your personal variables to find products right for you. You know, it could be synthetic chemicals, it could be organic chemicals, it could be for mosquitoes and ticks, it could be for adults or children. If you go to that link right there, you can put in what your needs are and find what's right for you. Uh, and you'll see that link right there on the page. Our, our team treats our gear with permethrin. And I do recommend this product if you regularly work in tick habitats, but it's essential that you remember to read the label. Uh, we spray our gear outside, we let it dry thoroughly, and remember that it's highly toxic to cats when it's wet. So as I'm sure most of y'all are also aware, ticks are really small. And when you find one, you'll probably find another soon. Because they are so strongly tied to favorable microclimates, they tend to occur in patches in the environment where those microclimates are. Larvae of some species, like the lone star tick, often transfer onto us in clumps. If you have several ticks climbing your clothes, you can quickly remove them with a lint roller or tape. I carry both in my field bag. For leisurely hikes in the woods, I often attach a few strips of duct tape to my clothes for quick access. And then when I see a tick, I can just kind of slap it with the duct tape and roll it over and forget about it. So several steps that you can take after returning indoors will also reduce tick bites. Check and wash or dry your clothes, remembering that heat, not water, will kill ticks. Check gear and pets. Pet owners are at increased risk of tick bites because pets can bring them inside. Shower within two hours of being in tick habitat and conduct a thorough tick check. Many tick check diagrams are available online. I like this one from the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Tick Lab, and I encourage you to check out their website. Unlike many diagrams, they make sure to point out to check between your toes. And one other thing, I put a link there to CDC's website on tick removal advice. Um, also, I regular, right now I'm getting two to three emails a day from people who have removed ticks. If you find a tick uh, and, you, and you want some more information, feel free to email me. And then I want to point out that uh, there is actually a lot of bad information in the ether about what to do when you find an attached tick. Um, don't burn the tick. Don't smother the tick in petroleum jelly or nail polish or other similar substances. Don't twist the tick. There's actually um, some devices you can find in stores that tell you to twist the tick. Um, that is not recommended. Uh, don't grasp the tick by the tail end of the body or manipulate it with your bare hands. None of these are useful responses to tick bites. 
And with that, uh, I'm going to uh, end the presentation, um, suggesting maybe we do another one on mosquitoes uh, at some point in the future, and then leave up this slide of acknowledgments. Um, I, while I take questions, uh, conducting statewide surveillance requires a lot of coordination and collaboration. And I'm very grateful for our crew and lab members, the vector control specialists at IDPH, all the collaborators and stakeholders who have sent in texts. And I also want to highlight a great citizen-based resource for the state at the Illinois Lyme Association, who are doing great work to advance the cause of tick disease awareness and reduction in Illinois. And then finally, none of this would be possible without the thousands of ticks I have killed. Um, and so with that, I would be happy to uh, take any questions that you might have.